Good morning, everybody. This is uh, uh, another colloquium by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia in uh, Granada, in Spain. And uh, today we will have the talk by Professor Andreas Eckhart. And he will talk about the relativistic phenomena at the center of the Milky Way. Professor Andreas Eckhart will be properly introduced by uh, Dr. Uh, Isabel Marquez. Uh, please, Isabel. Thank you, René. Hello, good morning or afternoon, um, everybody. Thank you very much for being here again. This is a, another um, Severo Ochoa colloquium. Um, I thank you all and thank you, more, most of all, thank you to Professor Andreas Eckhart, who accepted our invitation to be here with us. It's a great pleasure for us to have him here. Professor Dr. Uh, Andreas Eckert made his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn in 1984 about the investigation of properties of extragalactic radio sources. The next two years, he had an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at Stuart uh, Observatory in the University of Arizona in uh, Tucson in, in the United States. And later on and until 1999, he worked as a research staff scientist in the submillimeter infrared group at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. Um, I said in English, in, in German, it's um, um, not able to say, in Garchen. And uh, since 2000, uh, he's professor of physics at the University of uh, Cologne, Cologne in, in Germany as well. From 2001 to 2019, he was the managing director of the Institute of Physics at the University of Cologne. And since 2006, his external member of the Max Planck Institute uh, for Radio Astronomy, and he's also a scientific member of the Max Planck Society. His scientific interests cover the determination of the properties of Sagittarius A star from a multi wavelength perspective from radio to X-ray uh, observations, and devoted mainly to determining the accretion and outflows and the stellar dynamics near the Sagittarius A star as well. He also studies star formation in the galactic center the molecular gas distribution and dynamics in the nuclei of nearby active galaxies, and the conditions for star formation in nearby AGN and Quasar hosts. He is author of more than 330 refereed papers with more than um, 18,000 18, citations. Um, moreover, he also works for uh, instrumentation, and uh, at this respect, he has participated in the development and implementation of a sharp speckle camera at the ESO NTT, which was uh, fundamental for the discovery of the first stellar orbits around Sagittarius uh, uh, A uh, star. He's member of the Scientific Council and Executive Board of the German Center for Infrared and Optical Interferometry, uh, Fringe, if it is pronounced uh, correctly. And he's also a member of an international collaboration to build uh, the near infrared imaging beam combiner Link Nirvana for the LBT, for the Large Binocular Telescope. He's co investigator of the VLTI beam combiner Gravity and German co investigator of the European Camera Team for MIRI on board uh, James Webb uh, Space Telescope. He has deserved several awards already, some of those very early in, in his career. For instance, in 1984, the Otto Hunt Medal awarded by the Max Planck Society. In 2004, the Mann Sieben Medal awarded by the, the uh, uh, laboratory with the same name in Stockholm University in Sweden. In uh, um, 2019, uh, the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics as a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. And this year in 2022, the Ernst Mach Medal of Honor by the Czech Academy of Sciences for lifelong contribution to the physical sciences. Today, he's talking about relativistic phenomena at the center of the Milky Way, and uh, uh, we have the pleasure of having him here. Thank you very much, and we change seats. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, I will do my very best to give a nice talk with this on this subject. Relativistic phenomena at the center of the Milky Way. And let's first introduce the Milky Way a little bit 
uh, you all know about it. Um, it's a spiral galaxy that we're living in, and we're about eight kiloparsecs uh, from, uh, from away from the center of the Milky Way. That means we have to look through all the dust and gas uh, over uh, 26,000 uh, light years. And that uh, implies that there is an extinction in the optical of about 30 magnitudes. Therefore, you better study it in the infrared where the extinction is only of the order of three magnitudes. Of course, you can also do it in the radio and in the X-ray domain. And you have to go to the south because it's a southern uh, object. So here, if you would like to do it here from Granada, it would only be like uh, seven or eight degrees above the horizon or something like that. So that's not very useful. Then the uh, center of the Milky Way consists of a stellar cluster, uh, late type and early type stars. And if you go to the very center in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, you will find a cluster of high velocity stars that has been a uh, subject of uh, several investigations. A few are listed here. Um, and from this, you can derive uh, the central mass of the black hole as uh, 4 million solar masses, actually. So this is the um, uh, points that I would like to uh, put forward. I will talk a little bit about the instrumentation, only very, very briefly, just uh, giving names, basically. Then I will talk about the periostron shift and the gravitational redshift of the star S2. I will then go into other stars, uh, further stars, S stars. So S stars are the high velocity stars. So uh, we just named them one after the other and S stands for Stern star. So S1, 2, 3, and so on. So the S star cluster is the high velocity cluster. So I will introduce a few interesting candidates that uh, we found uh, recently that um, are on uh, very uh, ell elliptical orbits and um, we will see that most of them uh, also are relativistic objects, at least th th uh, during the periaps. We talk then about the bulk motion of plasma orbiting Sagittarius A star, and we will see that that is also a relativistic phenomenon, of course. And finally, we will go into the emission process a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about the relativistic electrons that give us uh, most of the radiation that comes from Sagittarius A star. Instrumentation. So as mentioned uh, already in the, in the introduction, uh, a great deal of uh, observations uh, was done both with the NTT in La Silla, but then uh, starting in 1999, 2000, uh, we used the eight meter telescopes uh, on Paranal. And also then recently uh, the interferometer that combines uh, mainly the four large uh, eight meter dishes. So most of the investigations was done, were done with the UT4 because that, con that uh, harbored the um, spectrometer and the um, uh, imager, the adaptive optics imager. Um, gravity, the interferometer, is a very important tool um, right now uh, to study the stars in the uh, center of the Milky Way and also other sources in the sky, other nuclei and also other stellar sources uh, on, all over the sky. Principal investigators, Frank Eisenhower from MPE in Garching, and the uh, first physics institute at the University of Cologne is an important collaborator here. So we came up with the two imaging or with the two beam combiner spectrometers that we built for the instrument. And then of course, um, I will also mention some X-ray data, which is uh, very important um, if you wanna study activity of Sagittarius A star, in particular the flares. Um, and those data were taken with Chandra and with XM and Newton. So the prime um, instruments that are being used for faint sources. Periastron shift and gravitational redshift of the star S2. Um, let's first talk about the phenomenon as such. Um, since um, a heavy mass uh, modifies space time, uh, it means that uh, in reality, a star cannot be on an elliptical orbit. Uh, elliptical orbit would be a closed orbit, that would be a Newtonian solution for the problem, uh, but actually, including uh, relativity and the space time deformation. Uh, you produce a Rosetta shape uh, orbit. So a periostron shift is imposed um, uh, for each flyby of the source. That means the orbit is not no longer closed. So that is the dominant uh, effect um, if you talk about very, very heavy masses. Um, there is another um, periostron shift um, that is due to um, extended mass, and that would be the ret retrograde Newtonian periostron shift. So um, not only um, does the source see effectively a different potential underneath itself uh, due to relativity, but also due to the fact that it may resolve an extended mass contribution. So if the star dives down towards uh, periaps, 
it suddenly sees less mass under it. So it's, it gets attracted by less mass. So the, uh, so the uh, uh, potential has changed and that again leads to a periastron shift. Interesting to note is um, that the Newtonian periastron shift is retrograde. So it goes the other way. So in principle, you could think of a scenario in which the prograde and retrograde uh, shifts uh, compensate each other. So therefore you have to uh, make sure that you know what you do and that there is no large extended mass around. For the galactic center, we can be relatively sure that uh, there's not a large extended mass contribution. Uh, various groups, including our uh, own group, have put limits on it. And the typical limit uh, is of the order of 10 to the four, and maybe even now a few times 10 to the three solar masses of extended mass that could be there given the uncertainties of the mass measurement. But effectively, we think uh, that there's very, very little extended mass that we have to worry about. In addition, uh, you have another a third effect, uh, which um, Subhayat in 2012 uh, pointed out, um, that is if you have an extended mass, it doesn't necessarily have to be very fine, fine, in, fine in, in composition to be extended. It could be very granular. For instance, you could have 20 solar mass black holes, uh, which are not luminous, and they could make up the extended mass. And then you would have a, a granularity of an extended mass. That also means that the potential underneath the star changes, but now in a, in a, in a stepwise way. But effectively, uh, that can also change the orbit. And you can think of scenario in which all these three phenomena are of equal interest in a way. So in order to study uh, the uh, potential effect of a Newtonian or of a, a, a gravitational periastron shift, a relativistic periastron shift, we made use of the fact that the um, orbit you expect is not closed, is not an ellipse, but a section of this Rosetta-shaped um, orbit. That means that if you take, for instance, the upper half or the lower half of the orbit and uh, fit an ellipse to it, you get slightly different solutions. Uh, also, you get slightly different solutions if you take the ascending and the descending part of the orbit. And the difference here would then be the periastron shift, delta omega. So you can look at all these um, um, at all these elements, eccentricity, long axis, and uh, omega, and they all reflect the non-ellipticity uh, in theory, if you do it right and if you're sensitive enough. In fact, we were able to do that. Um, we um, were able to uh, find uh, out that the uh, exactness with which the um, imaging data were taken with NACO uh, was already sufficient to demonstrate that in principle, you can measure the relativistic periastron shift. So the value that we got from that experiment is uh, 14 arc minutes and expected uh, from the 4 million solar masses uh, would be 11. So uh, quite close. Also, um, you can parameterize the degree of relativity. And we did that uh, as proposed by Zucker et al in 2006 by taking the ratio of the Schwarzschild radius and the periops radius. And that value was expected to be 0 0.00065, and we got 0 0.00088. So also very close. So in a way that works, and that actually led to a press announcement in 2017, in which we stated uh, that in principle, the data is present for a measurement of that particular quantity. And what it actually means is shown here, so in that paper that uh, responded from that uh, work, that uh, uh, resulted from that work, we were able to take two sources, which are on slightly more uh, larger objects where the relativistic periastron shift is not important really. Um, that is um, S38 uh, um, um, and S0102. And we basically, Hold on, held on to those orbits and measured the S2 orbit relative to that. And uh, the, the value that we obtained from the um, analysis basically shows that the uh, orbit would not be closed. And that is shown here. You see the star does not return on exactly the same orbit, but is a little bit uh, displaced. So as I mentioned, VLTI gravity is important here because you can do that measurement uh, of the relativistic periastron shift also and with much higher accuracy with the interferometer. And as I mentioned, uh, this is the consortium uh, that built uh, the, the gravity instrument. And here is a sketch of the um, 
beam combining uh, spectrometers uh, that we built. We built two of them. And uh, so we helped uh, for in a great way to uh, make that um, instrument working. So as you can see, it's a complicated system, uh, mostly um, consisting out of um, lenses and, uh, and, and prisms and prisms. And of course, there's also beam splitting um, uh, devices in there that uh, subdivide the information into various channels, which are then combined interferometrically. The data as such is brought to a common focus um, in the beam combination channels uh, in which the um, path length difference due to the source um, drifting on the sky um, uh, relative to the instruments needs to be compensated. So that is done by uh, mirrors that are positioned on cars um, that are uh, moved on tracks. And then again, uh, you have voice coils and uh, piezo stacks uh, that do the compensation of the um, fine, the fine compensation of the um, differential path length uh, that needs to be compensated. And then the light is led to the central instrument, in that case, gravity. And that is your first fringes with gravity. And you can see it's a complex instrument. Um, and you see a person here in comparison. And this is the corresponding measurement of the Schwarzschild precision, so the relativistic periastron shift. Um, as you can see, um, one had to depend also on earlier imaging measurements, as we did in our analysis. So this block uh, saying NACO here is basically the data that uh, you hold onto. And from then on, you can measure the difference to that, uh, to that data uh, with gravity, and you can see that the, um, that the path of the data here um, uh, de de deviates significantly from the, from the NACO data. And that is due to the relativistic periastron shift of exactly the same amount that we were talking about uh, earlier. There's not only the relativistic periastron shift, but also the gravitational redshift, which uh, is of importance and which reflects the degree of relativity uh, in the motion of that star, that particular star S2 as well. So that is uh, the, uh, the light becomes redder uh, due to the influence of the gravitational potential. Mathematically, this is, is expressed in this um, version here. So the, um, the redshift Z, that is delta lambda over lambda, can be written out in uh, a potential series uh, 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 with beta, beta is V over C, so the velocity in terms of uh, velocity of light. And the important term here is the B2 that is uh, standing in front of uh, the B squared term. And the B2 contains B2D and B2G, which is the gravitational redshift and the uh, special relativistic transverse Doppler effect. Both come in with the same weight of one half and you cannot distinguish between them. So you all measure always the same the combination. But in any case, if you measure something, you know half of it is the gravitational redshift. And the other half is then the transverse Doppler effect. And the amount that was expected um, was measurable um, with um, standard spectrometers. So the delta lambda over lambda that you can come up with due to this um, B2 terms is of the order of 10 to the minus 4, which can in reasonably easy to be reached with spectrometers. And that would imply that due to the redshift, uh, the uh, position of a line, for instance, um, would be shifted um, by the amount given here of 150 to 200 kilometers per second. And that would be the expected curve, um, the deviation in velocity. And this is the data. This is the actual measurements. On the right-hand side, you see the result of the gravity collaboration. Uh, you see that the rise was exactly as expected, and then the source started to descend. So the effect uh, was uh, getting weaker, and uh, the paper was written uh, somewhat faster here. Um, and uh, the com in comparison to the uh, UCLA group on the left-hand side, so they waited uh, until the data really um, showed that it came back uh, close to the earlier velocity measurements. But the amount uh, of deviation that was expected, namely the 200, 350 to 200 kilometers, was clearly reached. So the effect of gravitational redshift, um, as expected from uh, relativity theory, uh, could be proven here. Now, S2 is an interesting object, but it has uh, quite a long um, um, uh, orbital time scale of about 15 years or so. 
and uh, that makes it some sort of difficult to do repeated measurements. So the interesting question is, are there other stars nearby, near um, uh, the supermassive black hole? And indeed there are, so there's a number of papers out uh, here by Pisker, for, uh, for instance, uh, in which we published uh, the existence of such stars. So it started with S62, and then we got into other stars. So this is S62, which is, is on, a high, on a highly elliptical orbit. As you can see, it is rather difficult to identify that source. So you have to stare for a long time at these images to find these objects. Uh, and also the images shown here are not all by, by far not all of the images that we looked at. So we have multiple images for individual uh, epochs. Um, and uh, in, in any case, you can actually find these sources and you see them moving. And if you plot what you see, um, here is another case, uh, then, then it also gives also a very nice uh, elliptical orbit. Here's another case um, that we then found again here encircled um, in, uh, in white uh, dotted dashed lines and S62 I think here is given in a green uh, color. And we then started to give these sources um, cologne names. So we started here with uh, S4711. And if you are, if you have been in that region, you know that uh, 4711 is a very famous perfume uh, that you can buy in Cologne that is uh, originally from Cologne. I actually talked to the company whether we uh, are allowed to do that and they said no problem. If you don't mention this, uh, then you can use that. So we, we named that star S4711 and from then on we named other stars uh, uh, starting with that number. That is S4711, as you can see uh, in the RA and deck plot and in the on sky ellipse. Um, that, uh, that the data quite nicely represents an elliptical orbit uh, here as well. Uh, this is S4712 now, 13, 14, 15, and this is S4716, which is an interesting source. It is actually the source with the shortest orbit time scale right now. So that has an orbital time scale of only four years. So basically every four years, you will be able to do these uh, relativistic measurements. And uh, we are looking forward, or some of us are looking forward to do these measurements with the large telescope, with the 40 meter telescope, which, it, which has a much higher point source sensitivity than the eight meter telescope. So that's gonna be great fun um, to do that. Um, and this is the identification of uh, 4716. Um, so this is the, uh, as to my knowledge, um, best identified high velocity star in the S star cluster. If you look at all these individual data points in RA and DEC, that all fall onto the uh, very uh, same orbit that uh, S4711 has. And not only positional uh, orbit uh, points, here the magnitude doesn't deviate too strongly, so it's uh, the same source that we're looking at. Um, also, the spectroscopy can be done, and you can. Uh, Take the bracket gamma line, for instance, and determine the velocity of the star. And there's actually two, two, two epochs where the star is sufficiently isolated that you can get its particular spectrum. And those, one is close to periaps and one is close to apoaps, and those are located at the right velocities. So the orbit is also velocity supported. So that is S4716. And this is the on sky data. Um, you see that we have in black uh, imaging data in periaps, uh, also a lot of uh, imaging data in apoaps, more there, of course, because the source is slower there and spends a large amount of time in the apoaps. And as you can see, this source is also detected, and that's how we actually got to the source um, in, um, with gravity. So the red uh, data points are interferometric detections. So this, this star is being measured interferometrically and in imaging and in spectroscopy, and it has an orbit of four years only. And that is the um, solution in a corner plot demonstration. And as you then have the orbit and can, uh, can set equal the proper motion velocity and the spectroscopic velocity, you can also derive um, the distance and the mass and the mass turns out to be 4 million solar masses and the distance, distance turn, turns out to be 7.93 kiloparsecs in agreement with other measurements. Here is a list of properties that S4711 has. And as you can see uh, from the corresponding formula at the bottom, 
uh, you can derive all sorts of interesting relativistic properties of that source. So it has a um, very high velocity due to in, in periaps. And there's another list now coming. And this is actually all the stars now um, that are very close, uh, as you can see, in the inner uh, plus or minus 0.2 arc seconds uh, sur surrounding orbiting um, Sagittarius A star. And here is a little table that um, also lift, uh, lists the um, velocities of these stars in periaps. As you can see, um, they are reasonably fast and uh, come reasonably close to uh, relativistic velocities. Here, V periaps uh, is the, the periaps velocity. As you can see, um, thousands, several, uh, several 10,000 kilometers uh, per second. And uh, 4711 uh, has uh, 2,300. Uh, well, actually, very, yeah, oh, actually, uh, um, 23,000 uh, kilometers per second in periaps. So in comparison, S2, uh, the, the source that was investigated in great detail had only a velocity of about seven to 8,000 kilometers. So these will all be very, very good candidate, candidates to do the relativistic periaston shifts um, and uh, study the relativistic properties of that region. Now we come to the plasma. So we move into the inner region close to Sagittarius A star. So we talk about the bulk motion of plasma orbiting Sag A star. And if you have something orbiting, emitting and orbiting a very heavy mass, um, then you see all sorts of interesting relativistic effects. Um, in particular, if the source is looked at edge on or almost edge on, then once it approaches the observer, it is Doppler boosted. And once it's, uh, it, re it recedes from the observer, it's Doppler deboosted. Um, it's also shifted in frequency, of course, although that is not the prime target here, but you see a periodic modulations in its brightness. And there is actually two effects that are of relevance here. And as you can see here, the observer on the left looking at the black hole. And in this picture, we imagine a source that is uh, edge on orbiting the supermassive black hole at two different distances from it. There is one position, namely when the source is exactly behind the supermassive black hole, when lensing is of importance. Uh, so then you see a boosted um, uh, intensity due to the lensing effect. So the arrays are being bent towards you. So that gives you a, a brighter appearance, uh, that gives the results a brighter appearance. And then depending on the um, uh, distance of orbit, so the, the radius, you see these locations D. This is when the Doppler boosted uh, emission will be dominating uh, the emission from the source. And as you can see, this is not exactly behind or not exactly at the side of the source, but due to the fact that the light is bent around the supermassive black hole, you can sort of look around the corner and you see this Doppler boosting, i.e. When, when the emission is coming towards you, but then bent by the, mass, by the massive black hole, uh, at two different positions here. So what you expect is a lensing peak followed immediately by a boosting peak. And you can calculate for various scenarii the light curves that you expect. And you can see they all basically look the same. First, on the left-hand side comes the lensing peak, and then on the right-hand side comes the boosting peak. Now, we looked at X-ray flares. And if you know that, you can actually see it, that some of these flares, or actually we say all of them, have an indication of a lensing shoulder in addition to a Doppler, B, Doppler, Doppler um, peak. And that is also true for another flare, here, this Ponty flare on the right-hand side, published by Ponty in 2017, where you can see very nicely a lensing peak in addition to a boosting peak. So, that indicates that at least for the brightest X-ray flares, uh, you do see the signature of orbiting, uh, emitting clouds almost edge on. And you can actually make use of this. That's a very interesting topic here, um, because what we did is um, we've, we, can, we can fit from scale-free light curves, theoretically calculated, we can fit those to the observed light curves. And then by introducing the actual time the flare takes, we can 
remove the scale freeness and scale it. So then we have the light, the, the flare in seconds. And due to the scaling, we have also introduced a mass. So in other words, by doing this fitting with relativistic, with uh, uh, theoretical light curves, you can actually get back the mass about which that blob is orbiting. And we did that for all three, uh, for all four uh, flares. And we get, in fact, a value very close to 4 million solar masses, just from the flare profile. And by the way, we did this also with one extragalactic source in that very paper that also showed some quasi periodicity. And there you also get back the black hole mass that was there derived also by other means. So that's a very interesting phenomenon. So that's all, all consistent. Now, the fact um, that um, matter is orbiting Sagittarius A star had been a model assumption, which worked quite well. But then with gravity, for the first time, we could actually see material orbiting. We couldn't really image it, but the effect of a blob emitting and orbiting Sagittarius A star is also that the center of gravity of the emission uh, is shifted. Uh, so the, the interferometer, as such as only an imaging um, uh, resolution of the order of uh, one or two milli arc seconds, um, but the positional shift uh, is of the order of a few 10 micro arc seconds. And that is sufficient to actually do that measurement. And here you can see on the left hand side the x and y component of the measurement in addition to the black light curve. And on the right hand side, you can see the positions on the sky. And you can see also the um, central orange uh, position of Sagittarius A star. And you see that in that case, and I think in one or two other cases as well, more or less, um, a nice uh, orbiting track could be uh, proven, could be identified. So that for the first time gave true imaging evidence that actually matter is orbiting Sagittarius A star. Interestingly enough, with that method, uh, one finds flare, that one finds blob orbits which are more face on rather than edge on. So it's very likely uh, that, that both families of, uh, of flares exist, that sometimes the blobs are orbiting uh, face on and sometimes they're orbiting edge on, depending on where they came from and how they descended to Sagittarius A star. So all of this is uh, nicely spelled out in various um, publications. Uh, that, of course, brings us to other imaging uh, methods um, that can depict, um, that can make pictures of material very close to um, uh, supermassive black holes. And the prime candidates here are, of course, Sagittarius A star and M87, which are the largest black holes in the sky, supermassive black holes in the sky. And for M87, um, it was a little bit easier, quote unquote, uh, to do that measurement because it's a much more massive source, a million times more massive, and um, also a larger source, but therefore it's also further away. And but as a consequence, it has approximately the same size, as you can see, about 50 micro arc seconds on the sky. And here it could be shown that one side is actually brighter than the other, indicating that uh, Doppler. Uh, boosting is probably going on here as well, and that can then very nicely put into the other dynamical information that is obtained uh, and known for M87. For Sagittarius A star, it was a little bit more complicated uh, because the source is variable, it's so much smaller and therefore also more variable in comparison to M87. And this is something interferometrists don't like. Uh, while they're busily trying to fill up the UV plane when the source varies at the very uh, same moment, then you mix up variation information with structural information. And that's, that's very bad. But in, a, in any case, various mapping algorithms have been developed and uh, have been compared, and uh, they all show um, similar structures. And then in the end, one can, could combine all the imaging information uh, and retrieve the image on the left-hand side. However, at the cost of a, a problem here, that is, it is not that nicely shown as in M87 that something is in orbit and that some side, side is brighter. You have three bright dots on here, and we don't know, or it is not known at the moment, what these three bright blobs are and whether they will stay or not, and so on. So it, it, it needs to be measured uh, again and repeatedly. We now come to the after we now talked about stars 
and about uh, plasma blobs, so uh, physical objects that move with very high speeds relativistically, we can now go to the uh, smaller particles, namely uh, the electrons. We don't talk about the protons, which are certainly there as well. Um, and uh, But the electrons are cooling uh, much more massively since they are 2,000 times lighter than the protons, and therefore they are brighter. So the relativistic electrons are of interest. So if you look at the overall spectrum of Sagittarius A star, here depicted on the right-hand side, um, you see in this plot, this is a nu L nu versus log nu plot, that it uh, has a rising, in that representation, a rising um, radio spectrum, and then a relatively flattish, slightly descending spectrum towards the infrared and X-ray domain, and that there's certainly structure and, and variability as well. So the question is, what is it? Who is radiating here? What mechanism is of relevance? And one finds, I can summarize this here, that in the, in the radio part, longwards of a few millimeters, it's mostly um, synchrotron radiation and potentially also some Bremsstrahlung that is of relevance. Um, whereas uh, in the short wavelength domain, it is mostly synchrotron radiation, and then at the X, in the X-ray domain, most likely also synchrotron self-compton radiation that is of uh, interest here. So as a short reminder, what synchrotron radiation is. So synchrotron radiation, the photon measure of synchrotron radiation basically reflects the uh, spectrum of the energy spectrum of relativistic uh, particles. So if you have relativistic particles that uh, ideally uh, go from uh, gamma one to gamma two with the power law, uh, the power law spectral index P, uh, then that power law spectral index P is reflected in alpha in the optical thin part and alpha and P are related by P by pi equals one plus two alpha. The problem in the optical domain, in the radio, in the, in the photon domain, however, is that you have uh, self-absorption. So therefore, um, at the location where tau becomes zero, um, uh, or uh, tau is, uh, tau is of, of, of relevance, um, uh, then you have um, a peak, uh, self, a self-absorption peak. And the spectral index uh, uh, below that is uh, 2 point, plus 2.4. And above that, with the appropriate uh, spectral index in the relativistic electrons, is of the order of minus 0 0.7. Now, um, not only is there synchrotron radiation, but the bulk of the synchrotron photons are being emitted by relativistic electrons and are being scattered by them immediately. <laughs> So you have synchrotron self-Compton scattering as well. And uh, the, the Compton mechanism for high energies works um, opposed to the Compton effect that you know from laboratory physics and laboratory physics. Um, it is the photon that gives energy to the electron. But in uh, relativistic uh, matters, it is the electron that gives actually energy to the photon. So therefore, the relativistic electrons give energy to the submillimeter uh, photons and scatter them into the infrared or X-ray domain. And that then leads to a spectrum, a synchrotron spectrum, which is Compton scattered to higher frequencies. So that is relevant for the X-ray domain. And if you would talk to a gamma ray observer, um, he wouldn't even argue that that is of any relevance because they need Comptonization as they say uh, to actually um, um, talk about the existence of their photons, which they can count individually. So the spectrum of and the relativity and the, and the variability of um, the emission from Sagittarius A star has been um, investigated in great detail. So I will come to the uh, um, infrared uh, light curves in a second. But here is, uh, first of all, uh, a very nice paper by uh, Nielsen, uh, in which he uh, basically studied the, uh, the, the power spectrum of variability, if you want so. Uh, that is the, uh, the degree of variability um, as a function of count rate, uh, of brightness of the source. And that has uh, th this shape here, approximately. Yeah. You see, um, very bright flares become rarer compared to very faint flares. 
But you also see that there is a structure to this. And the structure is uh, basically dominated by the detection effect uh, of the photons on the chip. And uh, what um, Nielsen found um, by modeling this, uh, this emission with a bounded power law, that is a power law with a hard cutoff, um, that the power spectrum um, of that underlying uh, variability distribution is uh, 0.99. And we could verify that um, by reanalyzing the, the X-ray data um, that was taken by Chandra, for instance, uh, over a very long stretch, very coherent uh, data set. Um, however, we said, due to a reason that I will find, point out in a second, that it's highly unlikely that the bounded power law is the right pro approximation for this, because very rarely in nature you get a very hard cutoff. Most of the quote unquote hard cutoffs are exponential. So there's an exponential drop. And if you, but, but that makes the mathematics a little bit more uh, unpleasant here, but you can do it. So then we discussed this in the framework of a truncated power law with an exponential cutoff. And we got the different spectral index, the significantly different spectral index, namely 1.66, which first of all tells you that the um, errors that were attributed to this alpha um, did not at that point, also in the Nielsen paper, contain systematic uncertainties due to the modeling approach, because it was not correct, most likely to have a, cut, a sharp cutoff. Uh, but an exponential cutoff is more likely uh, the right way to do. And that is also uh, done here in the Zubrovai paper. And why is 1.66 so interesting? Because if you look at the, um, at the um, formulae which calculate the synchrotron self compton spectrum or flux out of the synchrotron spectrum, and if you take all the dependencies there that you can come up with, flux, source size, magnetic field, and so on and so forth. And if you do some assumptions, uh, which I will not spell out here, but which you have to read up, uh, and saying that basically only the variability of the infrared flux is of interest, the infrared flux here depicting the submillimeter flux of the, of the steep spectrum, um, then you have a certain expectation to the variability spectrum in the X-ray domain. And you can calculate what that expectation is, because then the spectrum, the spectral index of the variability plot in the X-ray domain depends also on the uh, spectral index, the, phot the photon thin spectral index. Here it depends, it's written as sigma of 0.6, so minus 0.6, that is, different notation. Um, and then you get 1.6. So 1.6 is actually the spectral index you would expect from theory under, these, uh, under the assumption of synchrotron self compton And now we have shown that by doing this more improved model approach, we actually do get the 1.6, which indicates that the variability spectra in the infrared and the X-ray domain are fully consistent with, all, with the bulk of the flares being due to synchrotron self compton So that does not exclude that some of the flares could be synchrotron in the X-ray domain that would require very fast relativistic electrons like 10 to the six, gamma, little gamma of 10 to the six or so. But most of them are synchrotron self compton flares with little gamma of only of 10 to the four, 10 to the three, and that you can easily get. So as I mentioned, most likely um, uh, most of the flares are synchrotron self compton flares which implies a slightly higher density yeah, uh, of the order of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 per cubic parsecs, per cubic centimeters. Um, but that is fine um, uh, because you do need a higher density uh, if you want to explain the rotation measures uh, observed towards the source and other phenomena. So a slightly higher density uh, and not unrealistically higher density because for pure synchrotron you have 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. It's all, only of the order of, an order of magnitude or so uh, more dense is fine. And most of all, it's only moderately relativistic. So little gamma is a thousand, which you can easily reach. So it's, it's, it's great. But that also shows you that um, in the uh, discussion of the, of the uh, spectrum, the overall spectrum, it is the first peak uh, which is of relevance. So this is the peak where the, um, 
the photon spectrum becomes optically thin in the submillimeter domain, because this is where the highest density of relativistic electrons and relativistic um, um, and photons come together and allow for a great deal of scattering. It is not other breaks, cooling breaks at higher frequencies uh, that are relevant for that process here. Because in the new L new spectrum, you only discuss the energy, but you do not discuss the scattering efficiency. And if you read up on the theory of singleton self Compton, uh, the scattering efficiency is purely given by the intensities, the photon intensity and the density of electrons. That could now in a very nice uh, work by Witzel be used. Um, so he produces uh, simulated light curves, and this is one of the way he does that. Um, so he basically starts with random numbers, then chooses the right um, statistics, and can then also uh, use a synchrotron and self compton formalism to modify the, uh, the, uh, the synthetic light curves, and then can reproduce the submillimeter light curves, the infrared and the X-ray light curves, and compare them to the observed ones. And they do have statistically the same properties. That's very nice. So basically, in, in his model, he uses exactly the, um, the, the emission model that I described earlier. So you have the um, here now shown in, 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 the, in L nu versus logarithm nu. You have the synchrotron self absorption peak of the red synchrotron distribution. Here, the scattering takes place predominantly, and that uh, scatters the spectrum upward to the synchrotron self compton scattered spectrum. And uh, that means that most of the flares are actually synchrotron self compton in that model. Interestingly, in that region, the overlap region, which is in the infrared, you have another phenomenon. Um, the infrared spectrum sort of turns down at higher infrared um, uh, energies. So there's a cooling break. Um, and the location of that cooling break may be variable. So it may be more energetic or less energetic. Uh, steepening or non-steepening the infrared spectrum. And in fact, some steep infrared spectra have been observed. Most of them are 0.6, so flattish or synchrotronish, um, but some of them are as steep as minus one, minus two or so. And that had been discussed uh, in, a, in a great detail, but this model now allows, um, that was also derived earlier under, under uh, different circumstances, this model now uh, includes all of the effects mm -hmm and allows you to uh, reproduce the variability in a very detailed and statistically correct way. And the inclusion of the synchrotron self Compton uh, mechanism in this, um, in this formalism uh, described by Witzel now also allows him to include um, adiabatic expansion and adiabatic compression of clouds, um, giving modifications to the rising and falling side of the flares. And he, he spelled that out how, how that can actually be used and then has this cycle of adiabatic expansion uh, and then uh, in, 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 in compression and injection again. So which is shown here on the right hand side. So that is, that is one flare. And you have probably several flares going on at the same time and being mixed up in the infrared domain. That's why the, for the very brightest flares, you can study um, the individual flare shapes best because they are more isolated than the fainter flares. Now, having said all of this, uh, having looked at the stars and the um, orbiting gas blobs, um, we can now uh, see what that means for the enclosed mass. We always get 10 to the, uh, uh, 4 million solar masses. So you see that the, uh, that the enclosed mass plot that comes here from the, from the uh, uh, parsec distance, from the CND and from the late type stars in the outer regions of the cluster comes down. Uh, to the flat part when you're dominated, being dominated by the supermassive black hole. Again, also indicating that the amount of extended mass is likely very, very minute. So you are truly dominated by the central massive black hole. And you can also put this in this graph. This basically shows the mass and plotted against the mass is a, 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 curve, a, a space curvature, a degree of relativity basically. And you can see if you are at zero here, you are then at the black hole horizon. And as you can see from terrestrial labs in the lower left, we made our way all the way um, through Mercury and uh, pulsars now to supermassive black holes and have here now uh, the parser paper and the gravity paper on relativistic periastron shift 
We have the PiSchar paper on uh, very high uh, uh, fast moving stars, S62 as an example. And we have the X-ray hotspots in the Carson paper um, that um, allow you to um, look at the flare shape with the lensing shoulder. And we also have the gravity measured infrared hotspots. Um, so all of this comes very close now uh, to Schwarzschild radii only uh, to the event horizon. So we are very close in and can measure the relativistic environment of the supermassive black hole. So basically orbiting stars and plasma allow us to probe the relativistic environment of Sagittarius a star in great detail. And we'll continue to do that. Um, so Cologne has been built a flight hardware, an imaging spectrometer actually uh, for James Webb. So this is flying and working and uh, we are uh, eagerly waiting for galactic center data that uh, has been taken and will hopefully then be taken also with MIRI uh, with the, in the, in the mid-infrared uh, for us and for the community. And uh, we are also uh, building a um, calibration unit uh, for the uh, ELT um, METIS instrument. Uh, so we are involved in, in this instrumentation as well, which then allows us to have access to imaging data with which we can also study the environment of Sagittarius A star. That was it. Thank you very much. I guess there are questions. Thank you very much, Professor Hector. Yes, please, if uh, there is any question in the room, uh, maybe it can be managed by Francisco or Rainer. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. I would like to know, besides the stars that uh, have been observed and are still being observed very close to the black hole, is the low mass population uh, not bright enough to be detected? Most likely, yes. But we don't know because we haven't detected it yet. Um, it, it's it's of uh, lesser importance uh, concerning the luminosity and the mass contribution. Uh, but uh, a paper that discusses that in great detail is uh, written by Sabra. If you look up Sabra et al., she goes in with uh, with a mass and luminosity function and uh, sees looks what the limitations are uh, with these measurements. Yes. Yeah. This all of these stars are only the tip of the iceberg most likely. On the other hand, we don't know um, how many fainter stars there are very close in, because you can think about dynamical processes that kick those stars out. So, so we don't have the answer, we can, but we can speculate about it. I have a naive question. Uh, first, thank you very much for the nice presentation. As far as I know from periodic amplified simulations in young stars, when there are several components, at least three components, one of the components could be ejected in the lower mass component. I am wondering is it would happen in the case of the galactic center because you have many components or if you can detect or it may happen, it may happen. We haven't we haven't observed it positively, but it may happen. And uh, actually one of them, uh, that mechanism is actually being discussed to explain the presence of the S stars in the vicinity of the black hole. Because these S stars, they are uh, O stars and uh, with properties very much like an O star population in the vicinity of the sun. So they're normal O stars, uh, but that means they are reasonably young. And the question is, how did they get there? Right, because normal star formation doesn't work. Um, and so, and you cannot form them outside and bring them in because then they become too old already. So they must have been formed in situ. Um, but there are ways to do that. Um, uh, um, there is a paper by uh, Jalali, for instance, that assumes that, uh, that due to um, collisions, uh, a um, gas cloud, a cool gas cloud from the circumnuclear ring descends towards the supermassive black hole. And if it does so, it goes in orbit. And then you have kinematically an orbital compression, which can push the density over the required density to form a star. 
and you can form a main sequence star supported by the gravitational field of the supermassive black hole in the very vicinity. And then some of them stay there. So that, that is possible. Uh, but the other mechanism, uh, that, that's why we're talking about this year now, um, that, that, that gives the stars, the young stars to the center is that uh, maybe they have been formed in binaries or there was a, a binary collision and, and then one was ejected and the other one lost energy and sank down into the, into the, into the region. So all of this may be of importance, but we don't have the real answer. We, we can talk about it, so. Thank you, Isabel, had a question? Yes. Um, with the advent of new instrumentation that we have for the, for the next coming years, do you, do you think that we have any hope of using extragalactic objects or other galaxies and ourselves to make similar or somewhat similar studies? It's gonna be very difficult because uh, the, uh, you, you cannot beat uh, the eight kiloparsecs. So we are in a very special situation here. So, I, and I doubt that, uh, that, that, that similar studies with, with this high angle resolution can be done in, in nearby objects. So it doesn't work, for instance, in M33, um, and you, you don't get that close, for instance. So we have to stick with this one case that we can study in great detail. Which doesn't mean that one can apply these techniques when it gets closer in, but not as close as here in that case. One of the 47 11 stars, does it fit completely into the field of view of, of gravity? Like this four year period star? Can you follow it? No, 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 no. It, 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 it goes into the field of view of gravity and then it goes out again. So, how far have, does it go out? Um, I, would, I would guess like two or three field of views. At least one. One, two, half yeah. seconds. Yeah. Less. Yes. Any other question? By the way, I would like to mention so, if, in, in case you're interested in other things, uh, Andreas is also a, a great knower of the Arab world and he actually translates astronomical texts, texts from Arabic into English and then collaborates with Arabic universities. So, so in case you have interests there. Um, you're very welcome to discuss this with, with Andreas. Interesting things can be said there as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we will go to, to dinner tonight. So anyone who I have not yet decided where and when exactly to come to if somebody wants to come along, we will come to people to my group. Let me know uh, as soon as possible because eventually I have to make a decision where and when. And yeah, thank you very much, Andreas, for coming here. Yes, Andreas will be staying until Friday if you want to discuss with him. He's in an, an, uh, in Anton's office at the moment. So thank you very much. Thank you.